why do bad things happen to good people? Yeah. Why does God allow this kind of thing to happen? And uh, sort of maybe an unanswerable question. Do you have an answer to that question? I can gesture toward it using rather abstract language, which is true enough. It's completely emotionally unsatisfying, but it's naming it, it, it truthfully enough. And it goes back to Augustine, which is God permits evil to bring about a greater good. Now, again, I know how unsatisfying that sort of spare, austere language can sound, but it gets us off the horn of a, the horns of a dilemma. You know, Aquinas, you know, when he lays out a, a question, he always has the objections first. So is there a God? Well, objection one, objection two, objection three. And he's really, talk about steel manning an argument. Aquinas is great at that. Yeah. Um, one of the really steel manned arguments is that the right grammatical form of the, <laughs> one of the what's the past participle of the steel man? Um, <laughs> but one of the, the best arguments he formulates it this way: um, if one of two contraries be infinite, the other would be altogether destroyed. And his example from his medieval physics, he goes, "If there were an infinite heat, there'd be no cold." Right? But God is described as infinitely good. Therefore, if God exists, there should be no evil. But there is evil. Therefore, God does not exist. That's a darn good argument. That's a really persuasive argument. And, and I think, I've done this for a long time in apologetics and in, in sort of higher philosophy, um, that's the best argument against God. Um, but you know, here's something, before I, I press ahead with it, something I find really interesting. I think the three best arguments against God all come from within the religious tradition. Namely, uh, the book of Job. So Job, he's great. I mean, he's a great guy. He does everything right. He's, the, he's God's great servant, and, he, and he's punished in every possible way. You know, he has every possible suffering. Aquinas' argument from the Summa, and then to your friend and mine, uh, Dostoevsky. I, I think in the Brothers Karamazov, uh, Ivan's argument, when he's trying to wreck the faith of Alyosha, and it's... Um, these examples drawn, they they think, from Dostoevsky, from the headlines of his own time, of the most abject cruelty to children, like an innocent child being made to suffer. How, in God's name, could that happen if God exists and he's all good? So I, I get it, but see, the Book of Job, Thomas Aquinas, Dostoevsky, these are all profoundly believing people. It's like when I hear um, Stephen Fry, you know, the uh, famously atheist writer, he he will bring out this argument with great authority. He does. Of, of, you know, children with bone cancer and worms that go into the eyes of children and blind them before they kill them. And But he's been preceded by the author of Job, Thomas Aquinas and Dostoevsky, who, who stood right, think of Job, in the, in the whirlwind. He, he stands there in the in the whirlwind, you know? So you can't blame the Christian tradition for not dealing with this problem, you know, for like uh, uh, brushing it under the carpet. I mean, it, it, has, it has stood in the whirlwind of this problem. It's still a difficult problem to deal with, that there's all this of cruelty of the world. It's, uh, there's a lot of example through history, just um, yeah. in my own family history with the Soviet Union, with... Yeah uh Stalin yeah the atrocities that Stalin has brought onto its the people of the Soviet Union throughout the 20th century is in, uh, nearly immeasurable yeah uh, and yet when you look at the entirety of human history you will see progress not just the Soviet Union but the entirety of the civilization throughout the 20th century and Stalin has a role to play there's a there's a dark aspect to somehow evil helps us make progress, and I don't know how to put that in the calculation. It's uh I don't you know on the local scale I want to alleviate suffering. I'm right probably uh, lean heavily lean pacifist, not a, out of weakness but out of strength. But man, yeah. It does seem that uh, history is sprinkled with evil, and that evil does somehow nudge us towards good. Yes, sometimes we can see it, and that's where the that's where the idea comes from that evil's permitted to bring about some greater good, and we can sometimes really see it. 
Um, can we always see it? No. In fact, typically we don't see it. But now you bring another factor into this, which is the difference between our minds and God's mind. So our minds, I mean, look, even they're remarkably capacious, but they take in a tiny, tiny, tiny swath of of space and time. And even like our eyes can like take in so much of the light spectrum and these little, these little ape sensorium that we have that could just take in a, a little tiny bit of reality, really. How are we ever in a position to say, oh no, there's no possible good that would ever come from that? Even the greatest evil that you know every Dostoevsky and and can conjure up and Stephen Fry, still, how could we have the arrogance to say, "I know there's no good that could ever come from that. I know there's no morally justifiable reason why God would ever permit that," because I think that's hubris uh, to the nth degree for us to say that, and that's the the assumption behind this claim that. God can permit evil to bring about a greater good. Now God understands it. But we're like we're like little kids, you know, like a 4-year-old and and their parents make a decision and we say, "What? In the, why in the world would you do this to me?" Um this, this is my pastoral experience years ago. There was a young father and his son was like 3 or something and he was in the hospital for something, I forget what it was, but he had to undergo surgery, right? So after the surgery, he's in great pain. This poor kid, this three-year-old kid, and the dad was there with him, you know, holding his hand and, you know, and the son, this is what the father told me. He said, he's looking at me like, what gives here? I mean, why would you, you love me. I've always assumed that. And yet you're presiding over this somehow. You're approving of this and doing nothing to get me out of it, right? And he, he said the kid couldn't articulate that, but his eyes did. And his eye, and, and the father said, it was just killing me because I knew I couldn't explain it to him. And it's true. I mean, he could vaguely gesture toward, but the kid didn't understand surgery and cutting his body and taking things out of it and that this was going to you know, make him much better in the long run. But I remember thinking that's a great metaphor for us vis-a-vis God is here's God, infinitely loving God, who's with us all the time. And we say, what are you doing? Why aren't you taking this away from me? And the answer, I mean, ultimately is trust. Trust me. Trust me. Surrender to me. And when we don't, that's uh, get, we get in trouble with the old pride and the hubris and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. No, but uh, and trust me when I tell you, I mean, I completely get it in my own life. And as a priest, you're dealing with suffering all the time, with people in pain all the time. I remember as a young priest, there was a uh, there was a policeman in our parish. He had, so he had a gun. And inexplicably, no one had any clue. He got up one night, shot his son to death, and then shot himself. This is in my parish. So I went to the uh, the wake. I remember I show up and I'm, I'm this young, you know, 27 year old goofball priest. I have my Roman collar on. And I I walk in and there were two coffins. The two coffins in the room. You know, there's the son and the father, and the mother was there, and she she went like this to me, like like she saw me. Like, okay, you're the you're the religious guy here. Yeah. What and just by instinct i i went like that too i went like i i don't i i don't know what to tell i i can't i don't have an answer for you but but i was there and i'm not saying to pat myself on the back it's just that's where the church goes because jesus went there see and now, now we're gesturing toward a, a more theological response the first one's more austerely philosophical you know, god permits evil to bring about a good but the theological response is that's where christ went is he went all the way down. He went all the way down into our suffering. And see the cross as the limit case of of, of evil, um, humiliation and cruelty and institutional injustice and psychological suffering and spiritual suffering and death. It's all there. And that's where the Son of God went. And I would say that's why as a, as a priest, I, I went there. That's my job is to go to those places, you know? So that's the ultimate like, answer to the problem. <laughs> so there is, uh, we can't comprehend it, but there is meaning to the suffering and the injustice. We trust it because we know on other grounds of God's existence. See, I, I, I would resist the claim that, well, this is such a, such a knockdown argument, so now we know there is no God. I would say, no, there are all kinds of other rational warrants for God. And so I, 
I know that God exists. I know that God is infinite love. And now I got to square that with this experience. And the way I do that is by a trusting confidence that God knows what he's about. You know, again, I know how how inadequate that always seems to anyone who's suffering, including myself, when I'm in, in great suffering. But I think that's the best that we've done in the great tradition. So if you were to steel man the case against God or the existence of God, yeah. you find the most convincing argument is there's evil in the world. Yeah. Therefore, there's no God. There's too much of it. Yeah, if I were to steel man that argument, I I do what Stephen Fry does. I would do what Dostoevsky's Ivan does. I, I I would do exactly that. I would say there's just too much. And then if, if you want to keep pressing it, um, animal suffering. So we talk about human suffering, but the suffering of animals uh, over the eons and so on. Um, isn't there just too much suffering to be reconciled with a with an infinitely good God? And that's again Thomas Aquinas. I've I've just used his very steel manned argument.